This week on the Backtable Podcast. If we have an outcome that is reproducible throughout different operators and centers, our oncologic outcome would meet a certain quality and we will have disease control over a certain percentage, specifically for the acclaim. We accepted that we will be treating small colorectal liver metastasis under 2.5 cm each. None of the patients will have more than three at the time. And the ablation confirmation must show at the very minimum a five millimeter margin or higher. And with that endpoint reproducible, we were confident that we will have a local progression-free survival of 90% or more at two years. That was the design that eventually they bought to, understanding that this outcome would help their industry, regardless of the device, which by the time the acclaim is done, today's device will be obsolete. Who knows what the device will be five years from now when the acclaim is done, and maybe six or seven when it's published fully. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. Now, a brief message from our sponsor. EDDA Technology is honored to be a participant in the Acclaim study as the core lab reviewer with use of its IQQA body imaging interventional software to provide margin confirmation review for the Acclaim multicenter trial. Used in over 80,000 cases worldwide and with a post-ablation analysis safety margin measurement as accurate as plus and or minus one millimeter, IQQA is proven to be substantially time efficient and precise. The IQQA software is vendor neutral for all CT scanners and PAC systems. IQQA aids in quantitatively locating and targeting needle placement relative to surrounding organs, vessels, and tumors for ablation, biopsy procedures, and post-procedural follow-up, providing precision 3D imaging for the abdomen and thorax. Ethicon New Wave is honored to sponsor this podcast as part of their overall support of IO Awareness Month. They are also a proud Premier Platinum Trial partner for the Acclaim Trial. From start to finish, New Wave is redefining ablation. The New Wave microwave ablation system features intelligent visualization and guidance software versatile probe portfolio with distal energy control, multi-probe synchrony, and tissue lock technology, all to help you achieve the ultimate goal, A0. Now, back to the episode. Welcome, everybody. My name's Bill Rilling. I'm an interventional radiologist at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and welcome to this backtable session on ablation margin confirmation software, and my pleasure to introduce today our two guests. Um, First, Kosti Sovokleas is a professor of interventional radiology at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York, a well-known ablation expert. And our other guest today is Bruno Odizio, is an associate professor of interventional radiology at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, also a world-renowned expert in ablation. And very happy to have both of you guys here today. Thanks for taking the time to do this. Appreciate it. I'd like to start out, gentlemen, talking a little bit about the background of sort of where we are now in percutaneous tumor ablation and how we've gotten to this point. And if you guys wouldn't mind just kind of going through in your mind what over the last 15 years or so have been the most important advances in tumor ablation, what have been the things that have gotten us to the point where we're being able to run a trial now that we're going to talk about later comparing ablation to surgery outcomes? I'm the older here, so I'll start with the historic background since uh, Bruno, I think, was still a uh, high school or something when we started this. But uh, in any event, I just want to remind everybody that we're talking today specifically for uh, ablation with local curative intent, and it's not any ablation. So to make our discussion a little more targeted to what we're going to talk about, we're talking about ablation for a small tumor that, at least in theory, would otherwise be able to be managed with a wet resection. And I'm going to limit this to the liver because that's what we're going to talk about. So we're talking about a local curative intent ablation in the liver. And we initially were treating big tumors. I'll remind you that back in the 2000, 2005, our cutoff was a five centimeter tumor. And it took us a few years to realize that when the size was three or more centimeters, we had 
very high rates of local failure or local tumor progression as officially is supposed to be named. And it was not until probably 2010 or so that we also realized that what made those bigger tumor recare was the fact that we were not fully treating them with a sufficient margin around the tumor. And by margin, we mean area of tissue destruction around the target tumor that at that point, by using CT anatomic landmarks, I think we had one of the first papers saying that we thought we treated the tumor, but actually 75%, we barely covered the tumor. And on that population, we had close to 100% local recurrence, which was embarrassing, but eye-opening. And where we had what we thought at the time, a 5 millimeter margin, our recurrences were much smaller, like I don't remember now, maybe 30 35%. And where we had 10 millimeter margin, our recurrences were extremely low, like, like under 10%. Although that group was very small, we had achieved a 10 millimeter margin barely in 20% of the patients or so. So that was the historic road or whatever uh, reference that I have in my mind. And that explained a lot to me why our local control on early data for ablation was so much lower than what the surgeons were reporting. Once we realize that and we strive to confirm with different ways, and we can talk about that more, that a margin is actually there and documented, then our results were much more like wedge resection. And when we started having 10 millimeter or, or more margins, we actually had zero recurrences. And I'm talking about just checking with CT and measurements. Excellent. Thanks. Bruno, what, what are your perspectives? Yeah, I would also echo the same impression from uh, Kossi. I think what we really learned in the last 10, 15 years is that there is a very strong interplay between patient selection, especially in respect to tumor biology and, and the outcomes of the ablation. So I think we moved away from this indiscriminate use of ablation to a more tailored personalized approach in terms of offering ablation to the patients who will actually benefit not only from the local tumor control standpoint, but also from hopefully the overall oncological outcomes of those patients by having a more strict criteria. And I think a critical piece of that was like Cosi mentioned before, it's this understanding of the need of qualitative initially and now quantitative imaging analysis to evaluate thermal ablation endpoints. I think this is an extremely important thing. We don't have tumor histology to assess our treatment endpoints like the surgeons do, so we rely on quantitative image analysis to do that. And I think those are the two most important elements in the last 10, 15 years in terms of research and understanding of liver ablation. Yeah, I'm glad, Bruno, that you mentioned tumor biology because I think, at least sort of in my practice traditionally, if I do a Y90 radiation segmentectomy or a chemoembolization, and if I cover the whole tumor, and if that tumor doesn't have a complete response or doesn't respond well, I attribute that to tumor biology. And on the other hand, if I ablate a patient and that tumor recurs, I feel that that's a personal failure on my point, on my part, and not the tumor. When in fact, obviously, biology plays a role in ablation as well as as in catheter-directed therapies as well. So I always feel a lot more nervous opening up a scan after an ablation patient than, I mean, I'm nervous for all of them, my patients and I want them all to do well, but I feel more personal responsibility for what happens after an ablation. I think, I think there's a good reason for that, Bill. Not that you are not doing well ablation, don't get me wrong, but I do think there is an operator's feedback, immediate assessment that can be applied much more than other treatments, just because that the end point in ablation can be more reproducible than in other treatments we do, like Y90, you gave the dose, there's nothing much more you can do. With ablation, you can actually check the margin intraprocedurally and know that you need to do another overlap. And that's why I think you feel that way, because you have the experience now that did I do enough? Well, did I check enough? Did, did I do the right imaging after to know I did enough? Because you have the ability to actually improve outcome. Coming to biology, though, the, uh, Bruno was one of the first people to write about this, and we have concurrent results as well, and others uh, have. And in surgery, especially for colorectal cancer, for example, we now know that if it's a mutant KRAS tumor, 
and you treat them even with optimal margin over 10 millimeters, there will be a recurrence rate much higher than if they are wild types. So for those, you may want to be more aggressive, and that, that's a great information to have. We have evaluated here with biopsies a lot, so we also know that if they have a prolific index at the end that is active, a KI67 reading, that they will recur. If you can see that index lighting up, their chance of recurrence is higher. So that requires immunohistochemistry, so maybe you can't see it intraoperatively, but certainly that can alert you afterwards for maybe closer monitoring, closer imaging. Talk to your medical oncologist if that was the only tumor, would they give adjuvant after or neoadjuvant? You know, so things like that are now coming into play. If I could just add a little bit more here, in this business of tumor biology, one of the papers that opened my eyes to that was a paper from Costi on radiology, where he published a 10-year analysis of colorectal liver meds on his institution. And there is a table there that it shows that patients who had prior hepatectomy, the local tumor progression rates they were not significant, but were much better than patients who did not have a resection. So this opens our eyes, in my opinion, that making a head-to-head -head comparison between surgical outcomes with ablation outcomes is flawed because we are treating essentially a completely different patient population in terms of tumor biology. And we replicate that. We show in our institution that when we do ablation of patients with colorectal liver meds who had a prior resection and develop a new tumor after the resection, the outcomes are very similar to surgery. The local tumor progression rates are around 5 to 7%. So I think the tumor biology cannot be overstated when we are treating our patients. Those are great perspectives, guys. It's absolutely true. And, and just to make it clear to the audience, Bill, these reflect actually tumor biology because the people resected were very, very heavily screened in that, in that cohort that Bruno is mentioning. And on the same cohort, you see that those that had any extra hepatic disease other than lung did the worst, where lung was kind of like, okay, at least in terms of survival. So I, I wanted to ask you guys before we move on, get your perspectives on the overall sort of investment in both innovation in the ablation space as well as clinical trial performance. Because if you kind of think about the whole landscape of interventional oncology, you know, there's been lots of radioembolization trials, for example, prospective large phase three trials that have been funded and run. And in the ablation space, there's been relatively few prospective trials that have, have actually been done and completed. Why do you think that is? And, you know, obviously we're going to talk some more about some trials at the end here, but what's the answer? How do we get more investment in this kind of work that needs to be done in the ablation world? If I may give some thoughts, I don't know the answer to why, although I can hypothesize one, one reason why it's because ablation is also in the hands of surgeons. And it was very early on in the guidelines, so it didn't have a hard time being approved for reimbursement, for example. So industry support desire was maybe a little less than, let's say, for companies that wanted to establish treatments such as radioembolization or drug-eluting beads for HCC and trials like that. So for ablation, a surgeon could use it anytime he wanted, and through that win IR, vicariously, we could also use it because it was an approved treatment on the guidelines for HCC and colon, at least, which is the, the biggest groups of patients that we use that. And, and the guidelines early on were saying you can use uh, surgery with or without ablation or ablation alone as long as you can eradicate disease. That, that recommendation is there for years. And therefore, we had not such a pushback, I think, to use ablation. That can maybe explain why we didn't have that many trials. The other reason I think why I didn't have trials is because the only meaningful trial would be to go head to head to surgery. And and there, you know, our surgical colleagues were resistant to do that or and it's not easy. I mean, to be fair, it's not an easy trial to do. And Martin is doing it at the Netherlands, as we, as you all know, the collision trial is a head to head to resection for I don't remember now how many meds at the time small mats. I think also due to the fact, contrarily to, for instance, systemic treatment trial, or even, you know, using the example of radioembolization with vitreo 90 trial, there are several vendors for ablation technology. And to congregate all those vendors, or, you know, the vast majority of them, 
under a single trial is something very challenging that you know, SIO was you know, incredibly uh, successful in doing that. But I think that's also an element of, of challenge. All right. So let's talk a little bit more now specifically about margin confirmation. And I think Costa, you already made the case about it's sort of intuitively obviously why achieving margin is important. But do you guys want to talk a little bit about how you use um, in clinical practice right now, how you use margin confirmation? And is it a linear, I'd like to know, is it a linear relationship between margin and recurrence? And obviously there would be at some point some diminishing returns from getting a bigger and bigger margin and obviously higher risk of complications. But I'd just like to hear in clinical practice sort of what you think best practices are. Obviously we're trying to establish a new standard of care with a claim, but I'd like to hear what you guys think right now. Okay. Yes. We're using a 3D confirmation, at least in my place, for quite a few years right now. And does it correlate with local tumor control? Yes. And we have shown that in prospective and retrospective data, and, and Bruno has done the same and others have done the same. And even more telling is the fact that local recurrence is concordant with the area where the margin is suboptimal. And by suboptimal, you know, one of the things that is still unknown to most of us is a five millimeter margin suboptimal, or is it a 10 millimeter margin suboptimal, or is it three millimeter margin suboptimal? And the difficulty on answering that is because the size of the margin greatly depends on the input of the images you put in the machine. Obviously, if you're putting images at five millimeter margins, a five millimeter thickness uh, it cut, anything under five millimeter measurement is unreliable because the standard deviation is probably five millimeters anyway. So it's like, it's very hard to do anything else. So the cuts are very important. Having said that, I think we all have realized to better assess our ablation zone is mandatory that we do a contrast enhanced CT on the day of the ablation, add thin cuts and evaluate the pre and post images in a 3D fashion. And that's something that it's almost like the minimum bare requirement at this point if you want to do ablation confirmation work, regardless of what software you're using. And I think we all agree that we need to repeat that kind of homework at least three weeks later and not more than eight weeks later to confirm that something that we saw intraoperatively, you know, it was not an hyperemia, it was not an immediate post-ablation finding that has resolved and indeed the pre-ablated tumor has completely been covered by the ablation zone with the desired margin. So that's an initial setup or on how we use it. We feel about the same way ablation confirmation methodology became the standard of care in our institution in the last few years. Every single liver ablation that we do, we try to use some sort of ablation confirmation methodology under a clinical trial or as a standard of care. And I think this is extremely important because if we do a parallel with surgeons, they have the histology results as they're doing surgery. And if they need to re-resect and extend the resection margins, they do that immediately. Us, on the other hand, interventional radiology, we use the imaging surrogate usually four to eight weeks later to assess the treatment endpoint of something that we did today, which is unacceptable in my opinion. So I think ablation confirmation methodology, it's uh, indeed the way to go. I'm going to add to this that both Bruno and us have now data showing actually that the intraprocedural assessment, it's more sensitive in detecting the minimal margin and the area of the tumor at risk. Bruno's paper is already published in radiology and ours was presented in SIR and it's under you know review for publication showing the same thing with actually real-time PET and margin assessments and all of that. Just to add here, uh, we actually have established now standard of care at Memorial going a little bit closer to surgery, ablation zone biopsy as a standard of care. It's no longer a research here, it's payable. And we do have cytology checking our um, tissue if you so need. It's not mandatory, but you have that option. So if you don't know if you killed it or not, you can do an immediate core biopsy or, or FNA or whatever you your pathologist is more comfortable with. And if you see intact cells, Although theoretically, in the original 20 years old publications by Naum Goldberg and whatever, they would indicate that those cells will die within three days. The data right now support that 95% of those intact cells will recare or show that there are viable cells in the ablation that will recare. And that's from prospective data and at least two trials that we have now published. 
So we actually had established also biopsy, a standard of care, at least for colorectal meds that are treated with curative intent. One thing also, just to complement this part of the discussion, is this definition of what we're calling A0 in parallel to R0. I think, as Kossi has mentioned, the definition of A0 will greatly depend on the tumor histology you're treating, but when you're using an ablation confirmation met methodology, it depends on the ablation methodology you're utilizing, right? Because it has to do with imaging resolution, registration accuracy, tumor and ablation zone segmentation. So I don't think we're going to necessarily have an AE0 definition across the board. I think different ablation confirmation softwares will have different A0 definitions. And I just want to put this out of there. It's a good point and it changes, you're right. And to address a little bit what Bill said before, as the margin gets bigger and bigger, we may start seeing more complications. I will tell you that in a 15-year review we published in colorectal cancer, I don't know, two years ago, we actually did correlate a margin over 10 millimeter with a very high rate of biliary complications on those patients that they were high risk in the beginning. So by high risk, there were patients that already had some sign of biliary dilatation on a scan before we treated them, and they had a great exposure to chemotherapeutic agents with steroid and especially exposure to intraarterial chemotherapy, some treatment that now many other centers in the U.S. will see, because from what I understand, a lot of other places now use FUDR with intraarterial infusion, at least in the colorectal yeah, I think those are great points. I want to just say that I'm a relatively new user for margin confirmation software. You guys both have a ton more experience than I personally do or that we do here at MCW. I would say that, you know, we've been doing post-ablation contrast-enhanced scans, you know, intraoperatively for many years. And traditionally, I think we all think we have these brains that allow us to basically do 3D confirmation in our head. I thought I was doing a good job with that in my head. And then once I start using the software, I realized that I'm probably not anywhere near as good as I think I am in my head. That's been a kind of relatively recent experience for me. So I just want to, because I believe that, and I'm sure you guys would agree that there's only a small minority of operators out there in the big wide world that are actually using 3D margin confirmation right now, right? So most people aren't doing it. And it just the experience of doing it and seeing where the gaps are is pretty powerful for me. So anyway, can you guys, let's talk just a little bit for a couple minutes about guidance systems for ablation. And I think you know, there, there is a relationship between putting the probes where you want them to be and achieving the margins you want. But can you guys talk a little bit about guidance and how you use that in your practice and the importance of it? I can start. We always use CT, contrast-enhanced CT with full breath hold, general anesthesia for our liver ablations. And that allow us to use some CT embedded software where we can target the entry point on the skin and the, the target point on the tumor. So that's one thing. And we do that routinely for every single patient. Our colleagues from Europe, they've been using stereotactic guidance for many, many years. And this is a technology that you do optical tracking using the patient as a reference point, and you advance the needles, the ablation applicators into the tumor. We did the first case in our institution of stereotactic radio frequency ablation under the support of Professor Bale from Innsbruck, Austria. I think this is an element of extreme importance to standardize the way we do ablation because on our coverall trial, which is a prospective randomized trial using ablation confirmation software for liver ablation procedures, we noticed that in about 40% of the time, the place where we put the ablation applicator, the needle, you know, the probe, the antenna, it was not on the place that we thought it would be based on the pre-ablation CT scans because just the fact that you're pushing a needle into the liver, that creates deformation, and that deformation might make you miss the target. So this is a very important step as we're doing ablation confirmation methodology is to verify where your probe is before you deliver the energy. And I think on that scenario, stereotactic systems plus minus robotic assistant, most of the robots that we have right now, they have some sort of stereotactic methodology incorporated on that. It's something that hopefully will help us to standardize and uh, optimize the outcomes of liver ablation among different institutions. 
So personally, I haven't used a lot of navigation. And the reason for that has been addressing the problem that very well uh, described by Bruno with a different way. And the different way for me was real-time pet. So by having real-time pet, that I actually do exactly what Bruno said, a um, general anesthesia breath fault acquisition real-time with the needle in place, allow us to confirm that actually the needle is properly placed around the tumor. And if it's not, you know where the tumor is at each given time you get a new acquisition. So let's say you did hydrodissection, the liver moved, then you have to get a real-time PET, but you can achieve that with one minute breath hold. And that's the uh, beauty of real-time PET. I do agree that stereotactic systems would uh, greatly improve our accuracy. I think we will still have problems if we don't see the tumor in real time, because again, with those systems, if there is motion of the tumor, you think you are in it with the 3D, but you really you are not, if you're not have a real visualization of the tumor after this manipulation. So I do think, and I know everybody says Memorial can only do FDG pad real time, but anybody can do it. You just need to book your pad once or twice a month and have an anesthesia in the pad. That's how we used to do CT. 30 years ago. We didn't have CTs. We used to go, I know some of you are very young, N not you, Bill, <laughs> but but at the time, I don't know, Bill, if you remember those days, We I, I remember the maybe at Memorial that we used to use the diagnostic CT and we only had it, I don't know, every Thursday or something. Yeah. So in any event, but I do think that having built in abilities of stereotactic uh, navigation and confirmation is extremely important. The issue that we have, and I think that's a society issue that we really need to address very seriously, is how to include all these added steps as billable steps to allow you, especially the extra time that is needed. There are people that say, oh, I, I don't want to do an ablation more than an hour. Well, that that's not adequate care today. And somehow we have to show that to the payer and the government. And I do think trials like the acclaim will greatly help to establish this as a new standard of care, at least the confirmation step, and then be able to to account for that, the time needed and the charge needed. Yeah, good point. I think, you know, important work that's being done already by SIR and SIO with regard to trying to get, you know, approvement for codes for these planning and guidance activities, which, as we know, are talking about are critical for the outcome. So, I want to move quickly on pretty soon to talking about the trials, but I'd like to just hear from you guys. I think until you do margin confirmation, it's difficult for someone who hasn't been doing it to understand all the different components of what you have to do and how important the consistency is in order to get your image registration right, in order to make sure that the what you're getting output from the system is valid and as accurate as possible. Can you guys just talk about some of those minimal requirements for imaging and the steps for, for margin confirmation software? Yeah, so for us, what is absolutely important is to get contrast media injection CT, either intravenous or intraarterial. That helps to uh, delineate the tumor. This is absolutely a critical step to do the procedure. We don't use preoperative CT scans because the tumor might change on the time interval. And that's one thing. And we standardize our CT acquisition protocol to try to address this matter. The second thing is you need to have, you need to understand, I would say, what registration methodology you're utilizing. Are you utilizing a rigid registration or using the formal registration? The formal registration is an intravoxel, it's a biomechanical model, because all those things might help you to understand the output that you're getting from the ablation confirmation methodology. The third thing that I think it's important is you need to have some way to confirm that that registration actually was done in a proper way. So it's a step of verification. And finally, which is, seems to be a, a simple thing, but maybe it's the most challenging element of all of these is how you can segment the tumor and the ablation zone in a consistent, accurate way with minimal operator input. Because on the moment that you get the operator to manipulate the ablation zone or the tumor segmentation, you include a lot of operation bias on it. So those are the, 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 the minimal requirements for us. So one thing I, I want to add here is that if you're just starting, I think it's important to have whoever is the company who provides the software we are using 
in place to show all the steps to you or your staff who is going to be using this software. It's extremely important. One thing that I would really, really be very um, careful and very uh, strict, if you wish, even on the acclaim trial, is that if you are the operator, you may have somebody doing the registration that Bruno just described all the steps, and they may be doing a great job, but you really must make sure that the registration has been done appropriately before and after by you checking the pictures. If there is manipulation and the contour of the liver, the portal vein is not in exactly the same spot on the pre and post, at least in the sector or the area where the tumor is, your registration will be meaningless. So I think that's an important step that you really need to check that the registration outcome reflects what you perceive the position of the tumor, the position of the nearer portal vein branch, the position of the of the liver edge in that area of the segmentation. I think that's an important point to make if you're going to start using ablation confirmation software, regardless of which one it is. Great. Thanks, gentlemen. So I'd like to move on and talk now for a few minutes about the Acclaim trial. First, before we get into the discussion, I'd just like to acknowledge the industry sponsors for this trial are, are New Wave, Varian, and Boston Scientific. And the margin confirmation software we're using for the core lab is EDDA soft margin confirmation software. So those four companies are all very critical to the success of the trial. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the uniqueness of this and bringing three different industry sponsors together to sponsor a single trial like this. And it was really a, a landmark effort and accomplishment to be able to do this. I, I believe it's the only multi-vendor sponsored IO trial that has has been done. So it's quite a it's quite an accomplishment. And again, thank you so much to uh, those sponsors who were who had the foresight to back and support this trial. So Kosi, could you you're the global principal investigator. Bruno, you are the site PI at MD Anderson and you enrolled the first patient in a claim. So first of all, Kosi, could you just kind of talk a little bit about the genesis of the trial? And then maybe just give a little outline of the trial design, if you would. Sure. So the story of how the acclaim became a, a reality goes back to a challenge between a joke between uh, Matt Kallstrom, Gigi Solbiadi, and myself in an airport during an ECIO meeting where Gigi and I wanted to see our results and stratify by margin. And Matt Kallstrom insisted that uh, if we really want to be believed, it has to be a multi-center prospective trial. So we took the challenge and I said, okay, so let's start doing this. And I think it, we started in 2016, having meetings in every single meeting of all the experts on liver ablation at the time and how to do a protocol. And then we presented a protocol to everybody that everybody had input on how to change the protocol. And I think it took us about three to four years to really come with the final protocol of the acclaim as you see it today after I don't even know how many meetings in person and then in Zoom during COVID. And I think we were eventually got the okay for funding. I forget now what year it was. I want to say 2020 or something like that. Yeah. The first contract was signed in 2020. Yes. So it took us four years to reach that point and it was innumerable hours. We changed directors at SIO through this process and SIO was helping putting together the meetings and supporting us and negotiating with the companies. We had meeting with, with the companies many, many times. And eventually I think the reason for success is that we as experts negotiated with all of them on principle that what we wanted to do was a device naive trial with a reproducible endpoint that had nothing to do with the operator or the device. And we convinced them to do that by keep giving them uniformly. You did that bill. We all did that. Every single one of us together and alone, we kept telling them the same thing, that what is worth coming out of this trial is that if we have an outcome that is reproducible throughout different operators and centers, our oncologic outcome would meet a certain quality and we will have disease control over a certain percentage, specifically for the acclaim. We accepted that we will be treating small colorectal liver metastasis under 2.5 cm each 
None of the patients will have more than three at the time. And the ablation confirmation must show at the very minimum a five millimeter margin or higher. And with that endpoint reproducible, we were confident that we will have a local progression-free survival of 90% or more at two years. That was the design that eventually they bought to, understanding that this outcome would help their industry, regardless of the device, which by the time the acclaim is done, today's device will be obsolete. Who knows what the device will be five years from now when the acclaim is done, and maybe six or seven when it's published fully. So that angle, negotiating on the principle that we want to do this to better healthcare and make ablation as a strong indication in the guidelines for the management of colorectal liver metastasis was the argument that convinced the industry to whom we're very thankful to help us along. And without their help, we wouldn't be able to depart on this trial, on the acclaim trial. That's a great, great lesson. And Kosi, you want to just mention quickly, talk about the core lab and the central review and how that works. So one of the issues that we had to face is how to navigate individual PI assessment versus what really an objective assessment of the ablation confirmation margin would be. So maybe Bruno or myself or Bill or our other PIs, the other PI that is open right now, just for the record, is Rashran Ayanan in uh, Miami, is uh, Mayo Clinic with Matt Kallstrom, uh, an oak uh, crew, I forget, oh my God, but so the Mayo Clinic PI is Grant Schmidt. Memorial is open. So we already have Mayo, MD Anderson, Memorial, and Miami that are now open and enrolling. And how do we navigate their reads with the true objective reading was by establishing a freestanding 3D assessment, the core lab, as Bill said it which is actually situated in Mayo Clinic, but is not controlled by Mayo Clinic. It's freestanding. And we all send de-identified data of the pre- and post-ablation images immediately into the um, machine on the day of the ablation. They do their assessment. We have to send them the tumor as seen in thin cats on the pre-ablation contrast-enhanced CT and the same thin cats on the same day on the same machine of the ablation zone with a second contrast enhanced CT. They register and use these results and they send us their assessment of the margin that if it's under five millimeters, the trial is asking the PI whether he would decide to reablate or not. So you get that extra level of reassurance or confirmation with an option to retreat in the trial if you feel that is clinically desire and acceptable. So that's the pretty much the core lab work. We do the same thing on the first post-ablation imaging, which is four to eight weeks after microwave ablation. We should say that the acclaim is not just any ablation, it's specifically for microwave ablation, but any FDA approved FDA device is allowed to be used on the trial. And in the future for our European sites, which are not open yet, any CMR microwave device and CMR 3D software platform is allowed to be used locally on the trial, but central readings for every side, European or American, will be done in Mayo Clinic CDDA lab, which is freestanding, not run by Mayo, run by the company, which is part of the funding that the industry has supported us with. Thanks, Kosti. Bruno, would you be able to go over your coverall trial and talk about the similarities and differences uh, to a claim? Thank you, Bill. I think coverall and acclaim, they are sequential trials. When we apply and we got the funding from NIH almost five years ago for the coverall, the idea was to develop, modify, validate, and implement a novel ablation confirmation methodology for liver ablation. So I think the core of the coverall trial is a technology-based trial. And it was a hard decision for us on the beginning to see if we would do a trial similar to a claim versus doing something more technology driven, but we were constrained for a series of things. The first thing is, since it was a novel ablation confirmation methodology using a biomechanical model, we would have to be fast in terms of modifying the methodology in case we needed, and that precluded us to do a multi-institutional study. The second thing is the outcomes. 
we are aiming to go to a local tumor progression as a claim is trying to go, but that would require 340 patients. And it would require also to be a histology-specific trial, which would be absolutely impossible to do on a single institution within a five-year NIH funding period. So we had to make this decision that was a hard decision at the beginning, is what would be the primary endpoint. And the primary endpoint that we decided to use was to see if using an ablation confirmation method, the one that we're developing, would improve the minimum ablation margins on the immediate post-ablation CT scan obtained at the end of the ablation procedure. And to compare that, we did a randomized study where the control arm will do ablation as we always do without using any ablation confirmation software versus an experimental arm where we're applying this ablation confirmation software that we have developed to see if the margins would be better. The interim analysis with 50 patients showed that the margins were significantly better using an ablation confirmation software to a point that the data safety monitoring board from our institution asked us to stop trial enrollment on the control arm, and we're finishing with 92 patients right now of 100. We're going to finish the trial in the next two months, and we're going to show, hopefully for the first time, that using prospectively, on a randomized fashion, an ablation confirmation technology will improve the minimum ablation margin. So the next step is how we can confirm that using such methodology will improve the local outcomes, and that's where the acclaim comes. And I, I hope that in the very near future, the data from the coverall and uh, later on the claim trial would help us to improve the reimbursement and actually allow to reimbursement of ablation confirmation methodologies in the United States. Thanks, Peter. That's really great work and very interesting for all of us to hear. I would like to know from you, gentlemen, if you believe that these lessons from these trials will be translatable into other organ systems other than liver. Obviously, right now we're talking about liver, but do you think that we're going to be able to take these lessons into lung and kidney and uh, maybe even someday into other, other organ systems to use the same principles? That's a big discussion, but to answer your question, I think when you are looking at curative intent ablation, the answer is yes. I think the results of the acclaim and any trial with confirmatory evidence of complete tumor eradication will come into play, whether that is just the software or in the future, even tissue confirmations or other imaging confirmations will come into play. I will tell you that we're doing very similar work with colorectal pulmonary meds in my lab using the same AC software as we have published on the liver. And I know from our preliminary publications that the five millimeter margin is critical for lung meds as well. So I can tell you at least for that, that is going to play a role. For the kidney, I think similarly, it will play a role. I don't know what that number may end up being. And there is great variety there of tumor biology as well. I'm suspecting it's going to play a role. I, I'm, I'm, I'm also in agreement. I think the liver allows, it's a little bit easier to see the treatment endpoint, the imaging signature of the ablation zone is easier to see on the liver, but I think the lessons that we have learned, they can be translatable to other organs and other ablation modalities, for instance, cryoablation, RFA, or IRE, for that matter. The other thing is when we start doing such research, we start learning things that we are not expecting to learn, such as the role of AI, of artificial intelligence, on the pre-imaging, on the pre-ablation imaging to try to predict the treatment endpoints. So I'm positive that we should investigate the same methodology in other organs and other ablation modalities as well. It might be a little bit more challenging, but I think the liver and the working that we're doing here is the groundwork to help us to move for the other organs. I think another point that is relevant, in my opinion, is not only focus on the local tumor progression, on the tumors that we treat, but the overall chance of developing new tumors within the liver or the lung, and I think that we as interventional radiologists, we have this very unique ability to have multimodality local treatments that we can use to salvage patients at the time of their recurrence, which unfortunately happens in the vast majority of them. So I think we also need to invest in research where we can do this multimodality longitudinal approach of patients with different types of malignancies to see if we can improve the outcomes and hopefully the survival of those patients. Thanks, Bruno. So just as we wind things up here, gentlemen, I'd just like to hear if you have any sort of general messages about 
margin confirmation for the IO community. I, I mean, I think it's been for me really eye opening, as I've said earlier, to start using this and see the advantages. And, you know, as both of you have been generating data showing how much better it is for patients, I think it's critical that we drive adoption in the in the community, out in the in the in the I.O. community. So you guys have any words of wisdom for our colleagues before we end up here? I will make a simple kind of like request and I wish everybody will comply with that. Yes, if they have the ability to have 3D software, they should use it. But I will go a little backwards and I know this may be sounding embarrassing. I don't think that anybody should be doing liver ablation without a contrast enhanced CT immediately after to show the ablation zone. And I know you guys may think this is a given, but it's not. And there are a lot of especially season IRs that they don't know that and they may just put the probe with ultrasound finish and think they did a good job and they don't even see the patient in clinic afterwards. So I think that's bad medicine and it should be clear to anybody in IR that if you're going to do a tumor ablation with the aim to cure that tumor, you should at least confirm with an immediate contrast enhanced CT that you have targeted the proper tumor, that the ablation zone covers the target tumor, at least with anatomic landmarks at the very, very, very minimum. And you should take over, follow up this patient with imaging at least for a year. Otherwise, you're doing bad medicine. I'm going to say it like that. I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. We need to get a contrast enhanced CT for and after the ablation immediately. This is the bare minimal to do the right thing for the patient. I don't think we can be more specific than that, right? Because he has to do that. And, and you need to follow them. You can't just send them to the oncologist, not looking at the pictures yourself. They may have untreated tumor and nobody will detect it but you. And by the time everybody else will detect it is multifocal progression and a possible curative tumor now has become a curative. And that patient loses his life, you know, three or four years earlier than they should otherwise do. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen. It was a great discussion. The time went very quickly here. So I appreciate your thoughts and your expertise and what you're doing for the IO community and our patients. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, Bill. Great moderation. Had a little fun. It was great, Bill. Thanks so much. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Dong, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross. Josh Spencer. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Social media and PR by Ann Dang. Manisha Naganathanahali. And Manbir Singh Subli. Administrative support provided by Jim Louis Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 